Hello everyone, welcome back to the Sports Copy Podcast. I'm once again Anshuman Joshi, joined today by Arunava Jodri and Karim Ben Sharifa, who is a football coach hailing from Morocco and one of the most highly regarded names in Indian football. And he has had a lot of time coaching in India with his time with Georgie Brothers, Mohan Bagan, Salgaokar, Pone. And uh, we are very, very grateful to have you today, Karim. Very, uh, welcome and thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you, Anshuman. Uh... Hi uh, Arunava, I'm glad to be here among. It's always great to 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 talk about Indian football and uh, uh, because I let's not forget I was part of this community uh, for nine years, nine long years, and uh, obviously India became part of uh, of me as much as uh, Morocco and I would say Singapore as well since uh, my kids are born there and. Uh, and uh, and that's where I'm gonna head back. <laughs> so uh, that that is lovely to hear. And speaking of nine years, those are the nine years of experience that we are going to be relying upon today. Because the topic for today's podcast, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, football coaching in the country. And uh, we have had quite a lot of discussion regarding the football structure in India of late with Arunava and. Uh, Today, now that we have Kareem, Kareem, I'll straight get to you and we get to the uh, meat of the topic. Football coaching in India. You have coached here, like you said, for nine years. So that would be my first question. What has your experience been working in India, being part of the system and uh, 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 applying a trade across multiple Indian clubs? It's uh, it, was, uh, it was challenging, exciting, uh, amazing experience let's put it this way and in my career i hold uh, what i achieved in india uh, in uh, in a high uh, position because uh, you know i i it happened that uh, i i progressed a lot as a as a person and as a coach in india and i developed myself uh, in in a great way uh, uh, the achievements are there uh, those achievements was not only because of Karim Ben Sharifa, but Karim Ben Sharifa was fortunate uh, to to meet some amazing people, whether players, officials, media persons. Arunava is one of them, who uh, who is a person that I met uh, in in my early time in in India, and we stayed in touch uh, since then. Uh, I don't think uh, you know it's not. I'm I'm very proud of what I did there. Really, when I talk about my time in India, I I feel very proud because in I I started at Churchill Brothers and I remember my first sessions, uh, which come during the monsoon time, and my first session was in uh, in Dando Ground, which is uh, it's not a grass field; it's just muddy field. Uh, and when I finished the session, uh, I was back home. And I looked at myself in the mirror, full of mud, and 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 my first question was, uh, uh, "Do you want to continue? Really, uh, is that where where you want to work?" And uh, I at that time I was I was like uh, with a lot of questions, but thank God I I adapted myself to to those uh, uh, those days, and uh, I think the achievements is I built in two years a very very strong Churchill squad. Uh, winning the first trophies, uh, uh, I think the Goa League, the Duran Cup, uh, and then runner-up of the I League behind the strong tempo of that time, uh, losing the league only on four goal difference, uh, moving to Mohan Bagan, uh, spending 18 months. I remember I said to my friend Debashi Data that uh, the fact that I stayed 18 months in Mohan Bagan, I'm going to put it as an achievement of my CB. Because Mohan Bagan, you guys, you change the coach every two, three months after one or two loss. Uh, with Mohan Bagan, uh, I, during that time, I have won three trophies and three runners-up. And I'm proud to say that the three runners-up was all when we are second, Churchill is first. When we are first, Churchill is second. So we, we was runner-up the, of the I-League, Churchill champion. We was... Uh, uh, we played the Super Cup against Churchill. Uh, we won it. We won the Calcutta League. We was runner up of IFA Shield final with Churchill. We lost. We lost during Cup in the final to Churchill. 
And and I I'm proud of one headlines during that time, Karim versus Karim, because I was coaching Mon Bagana against a squad that I had built from scratch with a lot of young uh, players who matured and uh, and uh, and uh, and have won uh, a lot of things. Then moving to Salgaukar, uh, a team that was uh, doing the lift between relegation, the second division, and I League first division. Uh, first season, I took them second from half half of the league. We we didn't only save relegation, but we end up in the top half of the league. We was the second best team in the second round after Bempo was champion. And the following years, we built a really good squad uh, based on uh, not only bringing the most expensive within the budget. We bro- we we I I was involved in the frog scratch in building and that's why uh, technical people have uh, to to build squads but the selection of players was based on uh, uh, on their skills on their position on their style of play on their personality and many much uh, much more and we end up a very uh, strong squad winning the double the league then the cup uh, then also Beside AFC Cup with Mohan Bagan first, second AFC Cup was with uh, Salgo Khan. Uh, at a time where uh, Oman beat an Indian national team, I think 5 1. Uh, we have beaten Al Oroba with seven national team players 3 1, and we was winning even 3 0. We want to, uh, to uh, we, we draw Neshti of um, uh, of Uzbekistan, the champion of Uzbekistan, uh, we draw them 2-2. This is a team that I think have beaten the year uh, before the Dempo, I think, with uh, many goals. I don't remember the score, but very heavy score. Proud of these moments. Uh, we During that time, I had, after winning the Federation Cup uh, with Salgokar in Calcutta, Salt Lake, in front of 70,000 East Bengal fans against East Bengal, Beating East Bengal there three one and winning the Fed Cup that's an amazing moment. Immediately I got the offer of coaching the national senior team of India. Unfortunately, the, the I was under contract and the president didn't uh, uh, allow this to happen. And uh, later on I moved back to Mohan Bagan uh, and I think that is also a period where the fans was unhappy with the results of Mon Bagan and the fans was going to the club with the with the with one of the demands bring back uh, the Garib Chacha. That's how they fondly called me in Calcutta, and uh, I was uh, proud uh, to be back, but also to be back. Uh, uh, one of the things that was the highlight that time is is the the highest paid coach of that uh, era. Uh, the the um, Mon Bagan had the best, the most expensive uh, player, which is Odafa, and the most expensive coach, which is myself. And then uh, uh, during that time, we, we after 10 games, there was a problem and the club was suspended and relegated. And then uh, by solving the problem, the management solved the problems by paying a big fine. But uh, we end up at the 10th round uh, with zero points. And uh, we had to save relegation. <laughs> and uh, after 10 games with zero points, and the second from bottom had, I think, 12 or 15 points ahead of us to save relegation. We was late by almost 15 points. And we did it three games before we ended the season where a lot of people thought it is an impossible mission. And uh, going to Pula, fantastic time with Pula. Very professional club with good infrastructure, good management. Chirag Tanna, that I salute, and he's still involved uh, in Indian football. I saw him lately with the national coach in the Salt Lake Stadium watching the derby, and I tease him with that picture. I say, I'm watching you, don't worry, we are still there. So with Puna, we we, we did the fantastic young side, and we want to, especially the highlight was uh, some good results. Beating, uh, uh, beating Bangalore in Bangalore, 3-1 is not... Uh, it's not uh, small results and uh, uh, being a runner-up on King's Cup in Bhutan with many international teams, even from Thailand. And we played against a fantastic side of Czech Jamal 
from Bangladesh uh, with a lot of high profile players uh, losing narrowly in the final. So yeah, uh, you you could see this is only small things. Forget about the, the record that sits standing in a league of 10 wins on a row with the three games with 10 players to the extent that in press conferences they was asking me whether we train with 10 players because even with 10 we was a strong unit. And I, uh, if you ask me, I was fortunate to meet some great people, whether in my staff, whether the players, uh, whether the respect and the, the, the professionalism that was between me and the media, all was great knowing how the challenges that are in uh, coaching in India, uh, you know, that many, especially foreign coaches could not handle that, uh, those challenges. And I'm glad that, uh, it happened uh, in a in a very good way and uh, uh, sharing one of my philosophy to achieve that to get y y to get the the team I always compare it to a chair or a table of four legs you need the four legs uh, w when one leg is missing the chair or the table will fall uh, the four legs are uh, selecting good players and when I say good players is not the best players in every position selecting a uh, good place that will work for each other and will be unity. But when I say best player is also the skills, those players, you make them super fit to play 90 minutes and more. And during my time, some amazing games, I still remember JCT losing 3-1 and still only 10 minutes to go. And we turned the table in the last 10 minutes, winning 4-3. That's fitness. Uh, uh, then uh, the, the third leg, is the strategy and tactics. And when I say about that, many people think we are not, uh, there's only few teams where the coach come with the, with the style and, t and, and the strategy and the system is maybe Guardiola, maybe Klopp who can come and say, I'm a coach who play 4 3, three and I uh, get me the players that I want. Uh, in our level, you have to adjust when I say the third leg tactical strategy is finding the uh, finding a tactic that will go to what you have you know you have to cook a biryani uh, maybe you have you have no meat uh, maybe you have less vegetables but you still have to cook a very tasting biryani and that's what i mean by the third leg the fourth leg which is the most important is the team unity and the team spirit that you have to create it when you have those four yes you are you're gonna win games consistently even with 10 even with when one is missing yes you can win some but you're gonna lose money and you're gonna draw money uh, when you have to fall you're gonna lose the win a lot uh, lose very very few and draw very very few right so uh Arnava, i will come to you because karim talks about his his work in india and took the time that he had all the work that he did across the many football clubs uh, I want you to paint us a picture as what is the outside narrative regarding the work that Karim has done in Indian football and uh, how uh, is he regarded even eight years uh, since his last job in the country? I think the first thing is that uh, Karim has uh, brought up a number of young, talented Indian players. I think the, my, my most favorite example is is going to be Gaurav Mangi Singh. Uh, you know, him and, and, and uh, Bob Houghton really made Mangi into what he became, even though I met Mangi when he was 15 and he was at the Tata Football Academy in the under-17s. And uh, I remember Islam Akhmadov regarded him very, very highly, but but Mangi was having problems. He went to Dempo, he went to Moonbagan, he didn't get his chances. And Karim really, you know, gave the boy his first proper chance, uh, uh, turned him into a centre-back and, 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 you know, um, and and trusted him. And not only him, other players, of course, we, you know, you have you had Odafa and all these other star players in the squad at the time but but again you know these young indian players over the years who've got their chances um and uh, and, and and trying to mold teams build teams in in all his clubs again he was talking about the salgaoka example yes you did have in the end a lot of national team players but at the start when you came in salgaoka was not regarded as a, as a as a big team you know it was a big zero team. national team player when i took over where uh, the following years eight uh, players was called some are very young Gilbert Oliveira, for example. Yeah. So, 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 you see that he's he's developed these these boys. He's 
He's he's worked with these boys again. I think Kolkata was, as he said, uh, said the biggest challenge. I think uh, uh, coaching uh, East Bengal or Mohun Bagan is is uh, with with the whole surrounding, you know, with the media, with the fans, with this whole thing. I jokingly tell to my friends in uh, friends in European football and and also fans of European football. I think sometimes I feel that. Coaching East Bengal and Mohun Bagan is tougher than, let's say, coaching a Bayern, a Barca, or a Man United. You know, with with all that is happening around you, and and all this this buzz and and the nervousness of the officials. You mentioned the uh, Devashish doctor and all these guys. You know, I, they're under pressure, and 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 uh, for a loss for these clubs is uh, yeah is worse than for for clubs in Europe. Really, you know, it's it's like Barca losing to Manu is a smaller loss than Mohun Bagan losing a match in the CFL against a small team potentially. Um, and 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 those kind of pressures, and and he was able to adopt. And as he said, you know, at the start, I think it was, you know, it was a shock. If you're coming from Singapore, even in those days, Singapore was very organized, or is very organized compared to India. Um, I think in 2006, um, Indian football was nowhere near where it is now with the ISL. Uh, that you know, the infrastructure regarding training facilities, the stadiums, the organization of matches, your travel, your hotel, all of that is top class. It's world class nowadays. And I think those challenges, you know, going to a club like Churchill Brothers, uh, which is which has its special charms with not only, you know, with all the Alamaos around in those days, with Churchill Alamao, you know, being the godfather of that team, um, um, you know, that you're working for a family club. I think that's, you know, those things to survive in that surrounding, to thrive in that surrounding, to be able to build something, you know, that has been sort of uh, what Kareem has really been able to do. And, and you, when you listen to him, you realize his love and his passion that he has for India and for Indian football. And that's great to see. Yeah, because those are like two things that you always talk about that Indian football fans need to have more of, passion for the country. So, speaking of uh, Indian football, once again, Kareem, I come to you. Uh, you talk about challenges that you experienced in your time here. So, could you tell us a bit about the challenges that you found were common in all the, all the places that you went to? But first of all, the infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure, the timing of games at uh, at a time where it's uh, so hot, uh, the the challenges of uh, of players sometimes unhappy. You talk about Guru Mangi Singh was at that time uh, a defensive midfielder with Sporting, but uh, nowhere near to have a chance. Uh, he came at Fatorda where we have training. As a very young uh, uh, kind of lost uh, player, he even I think he was start thinking of quitting completely yeah. football at that time. He wanted to go to study. Exact. And mm. uh, I, I was I was in my car and he was standing uh, outside and the the window is open because I was about to leave and uh, somebody uh, talked to me about him. So I I gave him five minutes. I told him, uh, okay, no harm looking at you. Uh, I don't know, I heard th good things, but you know, you didn't play, I didn't watch you. Uh, then he trained with me, I think, the next day, and then I was very frank with him. I said, uh, I'm happy to work with you, I'm happy to give you a chance. Uh, I'm not saying you're going to be first 11, but there is a chance that you, you because of the, the players that we have. And uh, I talked about that at the moment, uh, don't ask for money, don't think for money. Uh, Churchill will not give you uh, uh, what you think may be. So f for the moment, the most important thing is you get playing time and you get good training and it will come just, and I advise him don't, don't sign in two or three years to sign till the end of the season, which what he did and uh, he, he became the player. He so it was difficult with the many times you have unhappy players. Uh, whether they didn't get their sometimes their wages, whether for for many things, and uh, I always uh, used, uh, you know, when I talk about the team, uh, the team spirit, uh, you are kind of uh, you have to be a psychologist, you have to be a, a, a mental coach, uh, and I always uh, guided the player pragmatically. I don't give them false hopes or anything. Like for example, we. Talking about the challenges, we we had a game, a away game. I don't remember which team. I think Pune FC, and we had to play in uh, uh, Duller, I think, or Mapsa. And uh, we, uh, the, it was so hot, 
and it was an artificial pitch burning. You could, so I'm sitting there on the stand. We came by the bus and the players are changing to get ready for the train session. But when I look around and I observe, I notice that the players want more to go back for a nap than to have a train session, a proper train session, very slow. Uh, I could feel the body language of some complaint. And that's the day where I teach the players what is a body language first. Uh, and I, before we go to even the training session was supposed to be one hour and a half. I think I talked for about 20 minutes and the session ended up like just one hour. But sometimes it's more important uh, what you explain to the player than that train session. And I, I talked about uh, how I see them come in, I give examples, the player so and so, how he sit, how much he took to to start even uh, uh, putting his socks and all that, the other player, what he was doing. So I give examples and I say, it's not possible. Tomorrow we have the game, the first opponent is us, is not the, the team that we're going to play against. And one of our opponents is the heat. It's hot tomorrow. We are training this time because tomorrow we have trained that time. Can we change it? No, this is a schedule and we have to deal with it and get the best out of it. So if the heat already beat you 5-0 or 4-0 by the way your body language is going, how are you gonna beat the opponent? You're gonna start the game down by 4-0. Why? Because you're unhappy with the pitch or unhappy with the heat. So now, first thing that we have to do is we have to be today the heat in our mind. We're going to train in this heat, we're going to train in this field, and we're going to give our best. Otherwise, let's not train. You notice, guys, that I didn't even go to the field for, to train and talk tactics and all that, because what we are discussing now is more important than what we're going to do on the field. If this is not fixed, and I tell you, uh, and these are the challenges as a coach, with all these adversities that you have against you, how are you going to make the players perform and follow you in whatever views you have? And I and I always, yes, somebody is not paid, yes, somebody is underpaid, yes. How we we change it? By good results, by winning games. And you have at least strong points to defend yourself, to get your money, or to move to a better offer that, that will come your way because you end up one of the best scorer, one of the best players, or you're going to get called for the national. So these are the challenges that I felt that you have as a coach, how to motivate and make the players perform in some difficult conditions. When we was doing the preseason first with Churchill, we, for example, we work a lot because of the lack of infrastructure. We work a lot on the, on the beach. And we did those training circuits, which should be with medicine ball, with but we replaced the medicine ball. I brought back uh, buckets of uh, water and I put sand and we work on that. And that's the adaptation is what uh, gave Churchill the, 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 the runner up of the league and make them win what they have win later on uh, uh, in, in, uh, after, after that. So yeah, it's uh, for me the key element if you want to be an international coach is is the adaptation and in french we say l'adaptation c'est l'intelligence de l'homme uh, which means adaptation is the intelligence of human being so we we uh, i i always said even especially in calcutta they asked me you remember aronava when they changed the salt lake stadium from natural art uh, grass to artificial yeah. was one of the ministers that time who who take the decision and it was horrible decision and and the the players start complaining from the artificial from that. And the media come ask me, oh, tomorrow you're going to play in the artificial. I, and I, that's what I say to the players. And I said to the media, I learn things that I can change that's under my control. I want more equipments. I want better balls. I would fight and I would spend a lot of energy to talk to my chairman, to to convince, to maybe find myself kind of a sponsor or something. Things that I cannot change. How can I make a uh, uh, Salt Lake Stadium uh, uh, and, uh, a good natural grass? It's not on my capability. I don't have the money. I don't have the decision making. So I cannot change it. I would not even waste one bit of energy to even talk about it. 
and that's what I pass on to the players. The weather, we can't change it. We're going to play it too. We can't change it. It's hot. We can't change it. Ludiana is very cold. We can't change it. So what we have to do, instead of wasting the energy to grumble about it and to be in a negative mind, we have to be positive and we fight for things that we can change, but we don't waste energy for things that we cannot change. And this is not only in India, but in life, you should be like that. Right. So, uh, Arunava Karim talks about the infrastructural challenges that he suffered in his time. Uh, would you say that those things have been adequately resolved uh, in the eight years uh, uh, since uh, since his last job in the country, or are they still comparatively? We are still comparatively in the same situation, or has things gotten much better? I think the Indian Super League has brought in a revolution. What it when it comes to infrastructure, uh, stadiums, if it, uh, you know, fan amenities, the look at the stadium. I mean, if Karim was watching the Salt Lake Stadium uh, on the derby on Saturday, you would have seen how different the Salt Lake Stadium now looks than it was 10, 12 years ago. Um, um, I, I take the example again of this artificial turf pitch. Uh, a player who you also know, uh, Said Raim Nabi, was playing for us the opening game of the Indian Super League when we were at Mumbai City against uh, Atletico de Kolkata. And Nabi injured himself and he actually missed the whole season for us because of injuring himself on that field. I know another player, Michael Chopra, also injured himself for the blasters on that pitch. Um, so, so you know, the Indian Super League looked at these things and then realized, listen, this artificial pitch is not helping. Let's talk with the government of Bengal. Let's work on this. I think a very important factor is the Under-17 World Cup in 2017, which has helped India develop not only just the stadiums, but the training pitches. I think a lot of these training pitches which have come up, which are being used and especially the ones that say, when we talk about Kolkata, the two training pitches alongside the Salt Lake Stadium, which have been developed, those were not there. Uh, Kareem, most of the time, had to train either uh, at the at the Mohanbagan ground or, or, or you know, that terrible pitch at Sai uh, in those days. So, so, you know, all of these things have developed, have evolved. I think uh, if you look at uh, the coaching staff, uh, the, the technical equipments, um, you know, um, all of these things which, which were not there are now normal in Indian football and I would even go to the extent is that you know that the infrastructure now which India has which the Indian footballers have and certain people still complain is better than most other parts of the world so it's not an infrastructure problem I think it's 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 you know it's a bigger problem is the quality of coaching grassroots football youth football league structures how many matches are the kids playing and at the top of course that you know the the, the national team players need to play more more matches as well that is i think the bigger problem than infrastructure i think infrastructure it's it's one thing where the indian super league has done a very 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 good job right uh, just just a follow up question on that because we talk about the infrastructure of the indian super league and that has uh, completely been revamped but uh, the current model that the Indian Super League has implemented is more of a trickle down economics, where the money is supposed to uh, trickle down into the I League and the leagues there, thereafter. Has that actually happened? Has the infrastructure of the I League and the I League 2 has uh, significantly improved over the years? Yes. I mean, if you, uh, if Karim tomorrow would go to, to Mohan Bagan, uh, I think he would be happy to see what kind of infrastructure Mohan Bagan has at the club premises. You know, I mean, that is, uh, you know, the. the no disrespect, but when Karim was training Mohan Bagan, to some extent, it was a shack. The, that you know that building was a shack. Now it's you know it's it's it, they've redone it, they've reworked it. I think what the the ISL has done, especially in you know from 2014 to 17, 18, 19, was that the I League, you know, especially under under Sunandar Thor, realized that you know we need to evolve, we need to develop, and that that knowledge trickle down was happening, and also the big clubs in the I League. Uh, have learned, you know, what to do, not to do. Think about that. The ISL was played two years in a bubble in Goa. You had uh, 11 training grounds for those teams available across Goa. So those those teams could play uh, in, 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 in bubble seasons. Kolkata had its training grounds for the bubble seasons as well. Uh, you could play across three grounds. So all these things are there now, which, which were not there a decade ago. So from that perspective, yes, a lot has happened. Um, is it trickling down to, to the lower levels? No, it's not. I think that we need more spaces, we need more grounds, we need more facilities because it's very, very concentrated in the main stadiums uh, that you normally use for these competitions. In Goa, they mainly use the Dulair Stadium uh, or the Tilak Maidan. Uh, in Kolkata, it's mainly the, you know, the Maidan grounds, the Kalyani ground. Now you have uh, uh, Noya Hati as a new venue. 
uh, in Bangalore, you know, mainly they use the, the Bangalore football stadium, BFC plays at the Sri Kanti Rava. So all, you know, you know, Mumbai City plays at the Mumbai Football Arena while the I-League is played at the Cooperage. Again, we could go on and on with the list. You know, we need more stadium infrastructure, not for the top level, but for the sort of semi-pro amateur level, that that kind of football, where you don't actually need stands. You just need a proper enclosed ground of a decent quality. But I do realize also that maintenance is a problem. I hear that especially from my friends in the Northeast, especially, you know, the guys in Mizoram say that, that we cannot maintain grass grounds. You know, our weather, our climate does not help. But they also have a problem with maintaining artificial turf grounds. So I hope that in future, you know, these hybrid grounds become an option for India. Um, the AFF president, uh, Kalyan Chobe, and, 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 and the, the, the Secretary General, Shaji Prabhakaran, were in Spain and in Belgium uh, over the last few days. And they've seen, you know, these hybrid grounds. Maybe that's the answer to some of the solutions. Goa, for example, uh, now the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium is, is an hybrid ground uh, due to the FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup. Right. Uh, Karim, there's a point that uh, Arnava really mentioned that brings us nicely to the next part, which is uh, the uh, with that thing that I wanted to ask about the uh, coaching standard. So while you were working in the country across the different Indian football clubs, what was your experience uh, as far as uh, the players that you worked with, the coaches that you worked with, and their educational background in football? And uh, did you find that it was adequate uh, uh, compared to the contemporary uh, standards of football that we see in the rest of the world? Or did you feel that it was lacking as far as the educational uh, uh, aspect is concerned? Well, it's very, very difficult to, to talk about uh, colleagues. Uh, I would uh, say from what I know in the I-League, there was some really good uh, local and foreign coaches maybe not very high profile because we have to to make a difference between the career and the name of a sportsman as a footballer as a player and uh, as a coach and uh, many times uh, uh, officials and fans uh, do the mistake of uh, thinking that uh, uh, a person was the best player of his time, played many World Cups and high profile, uh, will be a good coach. It's not the otherwise uh, late Maradona that for me is the best player of all time would have been uh, uh, the best, uh, one of the best coaches. If you look at uh, some of the best coaches, some never, uh, we never heard about them as uh, players. Moreno, for instance, uh, uh, you have now, look what's happening in Germany. Aronava know very well. Some some coaches as young as 34. Uh, behind them, not a big uh, career. The coach of uh, uh, Bayern Munich now. Uh, uh, you have uh, Klopp, who wasn't uh, known as a... But they are some of the best coaches right now. You have the ex... The Tuchel. So, uh, but unfortunately... Now in Europe, they know it. The The proof is uh, the coach is as young as 34, behind him, not a big playing career. He's coaching one of the best clubs in the world. But unfortunately, in uh, I would say in Asia a bit, and especially in India, there was it's changing a bit, but there was time that uh, they're going for. So if you ask me, in, I, I saw in I think some really fantastic coaches. Uh, some I wasn't even... Uh, we we was uh, always uh, <laughs> opponents sometimes even on the off the field and in press conferences. But I have high respect for them as coaches. You have uh, 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 Mike Snowy, for example, who was with Pune FC, was not a bad coach. There was Oscar Bruzan, who did the, some good job with the with the clubs that he have coached. You have uh, uh, many local coaches. Uh, Derek Pereira, just again, we come to the trust that we put. Because a coach is like any job. You need to work, to work continuously. And the problem there is when you when you don't have trust in some coaches, if if you don't work for two or three years, then you regress. You don't progress. You don't get better. And that is another problem. So there was a time some really good young coaches coming up. Some Many of them was in uh, with me because I did my pro license there was uh, we was about uh, I think about 30 coaches or 20 coaches uh, many of them are I don't hear about them 
we should trust the, the law, the local coaches, but also uh, we should look at the, the and and here comes the the importance of the decision making people knowing what they are doing or being surrounded by you know you can be a chairman of a club and you know what you're doing and uh, just now we talked about the I League a person like Churchill trust me he know football he watch football on the street he watch uh, youth league he is in all grounds in Goa. And of course, by doing that for all his life, he developed the knowledge of what is a good player, what is, uh, uh, and uh, no, uh, no, uh, no surprise if you see many new names that come to Indian football was through Churchill, uh, whether coaches or even players. Uh, while, for example, sometimes the 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 coach, uh, the the chairman of a club, is doesn't have that knowledge. And even sometimes doesn't have the passion, but then it comes the importance of being in a professional setup where you have a club director. I, I know now it, I said some of the club understood finally that, and they're putting a knowledgeable person paid by the club who know football. He's not a coach, he's a club director, and he will take the right decisions in players, in coaches, and it will help. So, uh, to, to answer your question, whether then or now, I'm sure there's some good coaches, uh, especially I'm talking about the local coaches, uh, but you need to you need to trust, you need to give chance, you, uh, you need to look at the, at, the, at the quality of a coach. And I just uh, give examples, uh, Derek Pereira, Armando Colasso was a, was a great uh, football mind, uh, late Subhash Bombek. Uh, was was a uh, handy to play against him and uh, ask me in many derbies. Uh, sometimes he, uh, I, I I still remember one of the big games. Uh, uh, f- fortunately for me, but unfortunately for Urana, uh, Arunava, is the five uh, the five goals uh, derby, which is still now in the memory of every uh, every fan of uh, of uh, of uh, of Mohan Bagan. It was the the last game of uh, of Subhash Bombek, unfortunately, but I respect the guy for his mind uh, of of coaching. Uh, talent is there. You need trust, and you need to to give the same. Also, this is something very important. Uh, when you hire even a local coach, give them the same conditions as when you hire a foreign coach or when you hire a high profile name. Uh, that's uh, that's my my point about that, but. Uh, what what need to develop? Well, Arunava was uh, rightly at the start. He did mention it, but he mentioned it at the end. When we talk about infrastructure, we also talk about grassroots youth teams infrastructure uh, where they train. Uh, it's not only the, the 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 field where or the stadium where the team would be playing and would be shown on TV. We want to know. And to see, do the youth teams also train in the proper grass field with all the the measurement and all that? Uh, when we talk about uh, best coaches, it's not only for the A team but also for the youth teams, which is also very important. Uh, right. So that is the coaching side of things. So when you were uh, you talked about strategy being one of the most important legs on which your table stands. So when you worked with the players here and uh, you tried to impart onto them the tactical uh, ideas that you had that you wanted them to carry out, did you find that they were able to take those ideas on immediately or did you find that they lacked a certain understanding of fundamental uh, things that first of all need to be taught to them upon which then your tactical ideas could be taught? So what was your experience like working with the players? Did you find that they had adequate understanding of the uh, basics of the game already or the, well, did you realize that okay this is something that I need to teach them first before I even uh, reach to about, uh, try, uh, trying to teach them about my tactical idea excellent uh, question and Schumann uh, and here I will come back to the adaptation of course ideally is you come to a club where the youths from under 12, uh, from under 15, from under 17, they want to really good training with good coaches. Uh, they they learn all the tactics, the systems, and all that. It wasn't the case. 
most of the players that you coach and that they come from from the youths or especially the young ones uh, that does have many years behind them, it is always difficult. Number two is the when when it depends. Uh, your question, uh, my challenge was because I have always, and that was one when uh, people uh, who, who praise my style and all that, even players have talked about it. I'm a coach who when I have 25 players or 26, I want to develop all of them. I don't focus only on the 11 that will play. I don't focus the day of the game. I'm spending more time with the substitute players than this the players who will start the game. During the week, I don't do, you will never come to my training session and find two or three players on the side uh, doing nothing. Uh, and uh, what I notice, and, and I talk to the players a lot, that when a, a good player is, of course, good with skills, is good personality, he, he is not a trouble player or do for you problems, he have a good lifestyle, uh, he, he's aware of the importance of his food, his sleeping and all that. But a good player also is somebody who pick quickly what the coach wants from him. And the coach will love players like that. Uh, I give you an example, Gilbert de Oliver, uh, a player that I took from the under 18 of uh, Salgao Kart team, the youth team, trade with me for about not much, hardly a month. And he was new. He was just a player who I want to see more. I find him interesting. If you look at him as a person, he's small, he's short. He's not. Uh, he doesn't give you the uh, the impression that he. But he was strong. He was fast. He play on. The, he can play on the wing. He can play behind striker. And this boy, uh, I don't have to repeat. He's like this with his eyes focused on me. Okay, we're going to do, for example, a strategy. We're going to work on some uh, things that will happen many times on the wing play, for example. How to fix a player, how to overlap, how to cross first time, how to... All these things. I do a demonstration, finish. I don't come back to Gilbert. But I had players who keep me late, who hold me to move to the... Because with Gilbert, you have to move to another thing. Within... Uh, for example, many times as a coach, you come with your session prepared. You're going to have three parts in your session. You're going to have to have the warm up and all that. You're going to work on wing play uh, with the, an exercise. And then you're going to come to a small side games with an exercise on the same topic. And you're going to end up with an opposition. Uh, but many times, trust me, I spend more time than expected in the exercise. And I skip the small side games and I go straight to the to the big opposition or I skip the opposition and I, why? Because somebody like Gilbert, 10 minutes exercise, it's overdone. But many players, I have to stay three times that time or even four times to, because two or three players were still wide fixing the players. They go too much inside or they go on the wrong foot or, or, or. And though you explain and you demonstrate, you stop. You explain to one, the other one didn't pick it. While Gilbert have already done it and he, while you repeat, he's mastering it more and more. So depend on the players. Uh, they, of course, I don't blame them because they don't have really strong background when they were 12, 13, 15. The gold age where you, where you teach players between 12 and 15, it's just like study. When you go study, if you have a good base, then, uh, the high school, the university is easy. And uh, there are some places that st some students that struggle even at the primary and they cannot make it to the next step. Similarly with the players, I don't blame them because they didn't have that primary base. Uh, but some players was really amazing and fast. They pick things and uh, many of them, I would not, uh, I would not say very well, but it depends. The, this question uh, was always working on me because as a coach, you say to yourself, should I move on, even leaving some players behind? Or should I make sure that everybody on the same page? So that was always the headache. Right. Uh, Arna, I will come to you. And uh, this is a question that I have, I think I have asked you quite, quite a few times, especially on the Twitter spaces. As to uh, what is the current situation of the 
uh, licensing curriculum that the AIFF is providing, like the coaches that are coming through the Indian FA system, uh, uh, the the fundamental education that they have, is it adequate as far as the contemporary football scenario is concerned? Do, do they understand the basics or have you, uh, have, with you having talked to them, do you feel that they are lacking the, the most primary education that, first of all, needs to be given to them before they start talking about uh, coaching at the top level? Um, it's, there's, it's not a simple answer. I think we have certain uh, coaches, and, and Kareem has mentioned some of, of, of the coaches that while he was coaching in India who, who were of a high level, who had the experience. Some of them actually had problems with the licenses also towards the end. Um, so the question is always is, what can I get across in my sessions? What can I get across to the players for them to understand and then to, to implement on the field when they're playing? And um, the, the, the point is also is Julian Nagelsmann was, was mentioned as a good example of someone who's come through sort of the German system, started coaching at 19. Um, in India, there is this misconception in, in a lot of minds that you have to have been an ex-player of a decent level to be sort of a, a high-level coach. Uh, I see a lot of uh, p people, you know, we're talking the other day on the Twitter spaces about uh, people who are, um, you know, head of head of football or technical directors who don't have that much of a sort of technical football background, but have a good understanding of the game. So therefore, I think uh, everyone needs to be looked at individually. I think in India, the problem is you, you create a sort of a framework and everybody has to or, you know, you create a, a barrier, a border, and you have to go through this one gate. And if you don't fulfill certain criteria, you'll not be allowed in. And and that's a bit of a problem that we have. I think anyone and everyone who has a certain understanding of football, uh, who understands things, um, um, you know, should, should be given a chance. You know, one of my favorite examples is someone like Sujay Sharma, who's now head of football at, at, at Mumbai City. Who, who started working with me at indianfootball.com in 2003 and, and, and nobody, I think, in, the, in those ages was considering of, 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 of giving him a chance despite him being a very, very good football mind, very, very good understanding. Did you analysts as well? Yeah, with Pune analysts. FC. Yeah, he was at Pune FC and, and I remember Derek Pereira gave him his first chance at Mahindra United. When we had a conversation, Sujay became the first football analyst in India in, the, in, in 2005. And, um, and and again, you see how he's worked his way up. And, and again, that is, these kind of people are needed. It is not a question of uh, the best examples for me are Maradona and Pele, you know, who, who, who were not good coaches. You know, uh, again, Beckenbauer is a different story. Beckenbauer is a God-gifted person. Whatever he touched turns into gold, we say in Germany. But again, that's a point that, that you need to find the right people to develop. I think they need to have the passion, the drive and urge I very often in these days bring the example of Renedy Singh uh, uh, as, as you know, where who is someone, you've seen it in the few matches when he was coaching last season at East Bengal. You see that with an under-70 team from Manipur uh, on boys that he's worked on three, four years, wins the under-70 youth league. You know, we need these kind of characters. We spoke about Mangi. Mangi is hopefully going to be a good coach, assistant coach in Goa at the moment uh, under Carlos Pena. Um, so, you know, that's what Mera Juli Wado at the moment at Mohammedan Sporting. So these kind of boys need to showcase themselves, need to grow. Uh, while we also have certain boys who we don't know who are, you know, coming in from the side, so to say, who have got little uh, top level football background and then um, get these boys to do the best. Because there's very often what I hear across India, very often a big problem seems to be that there is this thing about coaches and, and people around clubs that they decide on who's, who gets in, who does not get in. And then there is sometimes all your agents. So the things are sometimes more important than your quality. And I think the quality needs to decide. Uh, we talked recently about age fraud, another big problem in Indian football. So these all these things need to be looked at. They need to be channelized, need to be organized. Only then Indian football can be can be successful in the long term. Or, for example, uh, I saw yesterday, uh, Philip Tosi assigned for uh, Vietnam as the head coach. See what Vietnam has done over the last 10, 15 years, you know, structuring their league. A building on their national center, building the federation, building also the, their regional football. And now Philip Tosier go, goes in and says, listen guys, our aim now is to qualify for 2026. And, and, and I tweeted about it yesterday and I feel that's a realistic aim for Vietnam. With, with, with eight and a half spots in Asia, Vietnam could actually do it. Where we in India, if we, if we say it, um, it's more of a wishful thinking that India is going to qualify for 2026. And that's the sad difference where there's a lot of work 
Um, and and I hope that, as I said, Kalyan and and, and Shaji can can change things uh, in the mid to the long term, so that Indian football becomes uh, stronger at the international level. I think club football has a certain structure now. As I said, if 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 you look at when when Kareem came in and what what he had to fight and had to face in those days, and if you see it now in 2023, it's come a long way. But our talent, our the quality of football that we have, you know, the jewel that Oliveira is talking about, that's something which is lacking. Uh, Anshuman, just to add to what Arunava said, uh, and it's also an advice to young coaches uh, to to succeed in any job, but especially as a coach, you need the passion first. You need to love what you want to do. You don't need to count the license doesn't make you a coach or a good coach. The license just gives you the possibility to work, but the coach have because many coaches have this wrong idea, oh, I have the A license. What is the A license? What is even the pro license? Is uh, A license is one month course. Uh, is how do you pick anything? Is especially now that there's so much material online, applications. Uh, so you need to develop the self development is very, very important. Also the the point is you have to work. You, you have you have the A license or pro license, and you were wait, you are waiting. You didn't work. You don't have a, a CV behind you, and you're still waiting for the best opportunity, the best paid. Forget the money, uh, just work first, and after everything will will fall in place. He gave the example of Sujay Sharma. Uh, I'm I'm sure he worked at uh, at the beginning. He was uh, he wasn't even myself. Uh, if I give you when I started. I had uh, worked my first my first year. I worked with fifty dollar monthly, and and the the second job to work with senior fourth division. I had thirty dollar less uh, a month, and you don't mind it. Money. I had with me a friend who was maybe better positioned than me because he was more known, and we both took that team. We both was having like fifty dollar each. As soon as the season finished, he said, no, no, I deserve more. If they don't give me 200, I will not. And I tried to convince him, no, forget the money now. It's, we are building, the CV is like building a, a, a high-rise building. You, the first floor, second floor, third floor. And I, I believe the foundation and the first floors, forget the money. Even if you work for maybe sometimes for free, you, you, you have to do it. And that's what I see many coaches lack when they count on the license, or I have the license, and when they, they are, they're waiting for the best opportunity, even in football, what I to keep possession, I always, when I do an exercise of possession, 8v8, don't look for the best pass. Look for the first option, not the best option. Because you, you saw the, the first option, and you hold the ball, you're waiting for the best option. The first option is gone. You don't find and you, most of the time you lose the ball because you are looking for that true ball. You're looking for the first option. So you, you have to work. You have to work. And that's the responsibility of the employer, but also of the coach. And sometimes it's complicated. He doesn't have yet uh, a strong CV or something, but he... He doesn't want to be an assistant coach. He doesn't want to be a youth coach. He doesn't want to work with the, the... For me, as a coach, when you start, you have to you have to do everything. You have to do a youth coach. You have to do a school coach. You have to do... And that's your development. Right, right. So, the, I don't know, I also talked about the, an example that I think brings us nicely to the next part of the episode. So he talked about Vietnam and their realistic chances of making that 26 World Cup, which brings me to the topic of finding a solution for Indian football in general. And uh, which is something that you said in the, the recently posted Twitter spaces that India would require, uh, India could possibly uh, do better if they were to go for a state first approach in first, instead of a nation first approach, which is something that I have been thinking about for quite a while, because uh, I believe that for a country this big, this vibrant, this dense with population, there, there is no one solution that fits all parties. So, uh, could you tell us a bit more about that the, uh, that idea that you shared the other day regarding uh, the, the states that are heavily invested in football, where football is the de facto first sport, despite not officially being one, 
So uh, uh, investing into them, uh, looking into the states first, then thinking about national solutions. Could you tell us a bit more about that? I think uh, if you if you look across um, India, um, there are first of all the usual suspects which you name, which is Bengal, Goa, and Kerala. Um, but there's a big but at the moment. If I look at uh, you know the, the discussions around football in Bengal uh, post the the Santos Trophy exit, and Bengal are record champions. Uh, Kerala, as defending champions, were also eliminated. They will not be also featuring in Riyadh. And also they've had a discussion about it. Goa has had its own struggles over the last few years. And uh, especially the problem has been that they had four teams in their prime in, in the I-League, in the NFL, and uh, which gave a lot of opportunities for, for local Goan boys. Um, FC Goa, I think the jump is too high. Um, Churchill Brothers, of course, is still there. It's giving, giving chances to boys if... You see Saurav and Bryce Miranda last season at Churchill. Now they're at uh, Kerala Blasters. Um, but I would say, um, interesting, um, at the northeastern states, you know, Mizoram, my first visit was over a decade back and, and they had nothing, you know, and they are now at the forefront. Manipur has always been uh, around there now, always saying in the last, you know, 30, 35 years that Manipur has been at the top. Um you have at the moment Karnataka doing very, very well. Bangalore, you know, they, they, they sorted out the structure. I think the Bangalore Super Division is most probably the strongest local league over there. So therefore, you've got different models. And I think the regional, or the, not the regional, the local, it has to be local. Development in India, because India is not a country. It's, it's, it's a subcontinent. It's so big. And, if, and, and, and I know in Twitter spaces, we've discussed it that people say, oh, you know, why don't you focus on the Northern Bay? Why don't you focus on Uttar Pradesh? On Madhya Pradesh, on Rajasthan, on 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 Gujarat, on on, on Haryana, and all. India's so big. If 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 these few states who have football, who have strong football roots, or have built strong football roots over the last few years, work and develop Indian football, then the overall standard moves up. And I think that's the that's the that's the challenge that Indian football has. Uh, we cannot develop uh, football across all states, all union territories in India in parallel. I think we'll have different levels of development. And, and that is that is there everywhere around the world. You know, football, if you think here in Germany, um, I live in the West. Here in the West, football is, is part hardcore. You know, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of life. Uh, elsewhere, it, it might not be. There are other sports. There are other parts of Germany where, for example, ice hockey is very popular. Handball is very popular. Uh, you know, other sports are very popular. So therefore, you have to sort of work at different levels, different paces as well. You know, it's, it's the ones which want to work hard and develop their football faster. You should not bog them down because you're trying to develop the whole country. I think you need to create most probably three, four tiers or three, four levels of development, which is which is outside of the development of the club football scene at 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 ISL and I League level. That's a that's a different discussion. But I think at grassroots and youth football level, we need to develop that. And I think the AFF is trying to work towards it with the state associations to try and get the state associations to hold leagues of 8, of 12, of 16 teams at youth level. And then the best teams progress to the national level. And, and I've also said is that if you've got, let's say, 16 teams, but this, the gulf of standard is too far away, then make two tiers of 18. Let them play three, four times against each other. But then the, you know, the top teams compete at a higher level and that those are those are the challenges i think that they need to understand and try to find uh, means and ways of working or what we in germany are doing at under 9 under 11 level there are no results you know then they're, they're trying to get this thinking of winning out it's about everybody every player has to have a, a minimum number of minutes you're not even they're even saying we're not going to even playing on one big goal we're going to play on two two smaller goals which are placed apart. So there are a lot of these new ideas which are roaming around in world football so that you get as many players as possible through the system to a certain level so that your pyramid does not, you know, does not become so thin too early so that you have more players and then you can pick from, from more players. So therefore, there are a lot of these challenges that we have in India. Right. Uh, Karim, what are your thoughts on the matter? Not very far from uh, what Arunava said and the uh... We discussed it in one of the, the the podcasts or Twitter space. I I feel, and this is in general, and I I really in that space while people are giving their opinions, I'm thinking, and I'm taking as example my country Morocco that I know very well. What I feel 
is uh, Morocco was for years trying to uh, to to develop the league, the clubs, uh, many clubs in first division, second division, uh, professional leagues, yeah. amateur leagues. I think three divisions, then regionals. Then then we have about ten regions in Morocco, uh, or maybe eleven regions geographically. Uh, the federation was busy trying to develop all those people. The problem is, is those uh, club presidents. Uh, many, I would say, let's say about uh, 16 in first division, another 16 in second division, uh, another. So we're talking here, if we talk clubs, uh, professional amateur regions, we're talking about trying to make the mindset of about 60 people who are running their club or their state to be with you in your idea. And actually, you end up spreading your energy, getting tired, spreading the resources, because your Morocco at certain times, a few years back, gave to every club is the federation who pay those people: technical director, the fitness trainer, and I think goalkeeper coach. Three people for every club. Some of them coming from abroad, well paid. But what happened? Because the club have no structure. That the other coaches that will work with these guys, these guys are paid, well paid, but the guys, the youth coaches, they are less paid and not paid regularly. So here already you have a problem because they will not work with you. In fact, the other people who are not well paid, they was making problems for the other ones and they didn't succeed at all. So we tried everything. And I think what we did right and what it's a good example. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not giving lessons here. I'm just sharing uh, what could be done is let's le le the, the football scenario in the country, let it go. I will try after we try, but not with the full energy on waiting for them to do the job, waiting for them to give us players. There will be leaks. There will be a, 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 an atmosphere of football going on. Not perfect, but let's my energy, my money, I do it with things that I can control myself. One, uh, w w the Federation did its own football national center with many feel I shared the video with the Aronava. I think you had seen. It's world class. It's better than Claire Fontaine, who is one of the best in the world uh, with the football fields, indoor field. Uh, everything we 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 did futsal, we did women football, we did uh, with the classes for for a school inside the center with a big block medical center. Uh, there is good food, there is good medication, there is everything. It's a high professional level, and we didn't select a lot. We select, I think, uh, we started with like 20, 25 kids under fifteen, under seventeen who are training, sleeping there, studying there. They go the weekend, they play with the, for the women team, we register them in the regional, uh, in that region of Rabat. Uh, they have a league of under 15 boys, the under 17 girls play, other team in this. So we find some solutions that we control and we give those that. What happened is over time, the, the base of the national team, well, strongly, uh, built in terms of tactics, in terms of the physicality, in terms of everything, scientifically, after those under 15, after four years, they became 20s, they became those under 17, after four years, they became 21, they became senior players. So they start going to the clubs and the, you end up with the national team made by somebody you have to control, by a strategy that you have under your control with uh, uh, I would say 70% of the Martian team would be from those players who want through your top high level system. And that football, the clubs and all that, if they give two or three players, it's most welcome. It's okay. They didn't give you the most because they are not working to that level that you want. And abroad, some players, we have the luck. That's uh, also our luck that we have abroad some B national players that are born in Holland, born in Germany or born in France. And, but the base, 
we came from something that you did. The, the, the National Football Center, depending on the Federation, and kind of private academy, also same. In the same area, in Rabat, that they have also the, the kids they, they selected, they study there, they, they live there. They... And then you convince, we have now, uh, I would say, three clubs who are top professional. They are doing the same. Now, the next step, what the Federation did, is the regions. Not all, we have 10 regions, but they looked at those regions who are working very well, who have people, same mindset as what the Federation want to do, and they create regional football center. Similar, not the high standard as what the National Football Center, but uh, uh, fo uh, f regional football centers who the selection of the region of that region is going there and those they will give you they give you every year or they give you three years uh, from now with their work and their professional work they give you another two to three players it's great and that's how you do so finally the things that you control will give you the base some regional good centers with good people working profession they will give you two three players and the scenario the big scenario the country the leagues and all that though they are not working professionally but they end up accidentally giving you some talent and you end up at least with your base uh, when foundation what we talked about since they have 12 13 14 working on that and especially for country like india it's so difficult to spend all your energy developing football in the whole country it's huge it's big as arunava said first what I can control myself, resources, this, I do my own infrastructure, my own feed, my own hotel. I will bring kids to study, to sleep there, to eat there properly, to even 30 players, 40 players, 25 players, but at least a start. But a five-star football center. And then, okay, Goa is working with her. I do a football center there, regional. Uh, Bengal is popular, the game and all that. I do one and I convince maybe and I do it even private. Why not? So, uh, and for that, you need to convince you similar mindset to have the resources, sponsors to do, not to develop football in the whole country is almost close to impossible. Not to develop in all regions, not to develop all clubs. It's, it's very difficult, but okay. I have these resources, human resources, financial resources. I channelize them through a project slightly smaller, but I can control. And if they give me, if a, a national football center, which I would select to the country now, I know there is so many youth schools, youth academies in Mumbai, in Bangalore. I'm sure I'm going to find a 30 uh, kid that at 13 or 14, they will have those. They just need to be nurtured properly. And I put them there. And then in the meantime, I'm trying to pull the rest of the clubs of the regions uh, going with me. This is how I see uh, things that can work differently for a country like India. Uh, right. I don't know about, uh, Karim uh, mentions convincing the right people. And uh, so I, I'll just mention the example of cricket where the popularity of Indian Premier League meant that even state level uh, franchise T20 cricket became incredibly popular. So you had like Maharashtra Premier League, even Mumbai Premier League, Tamil Nadu Premier League who have become very popular tournaments in their own self now. Now, state-run localized football leagues do exist. We know that. But uh, how exactly do we uh, convince these right people? Is there a p possibility of uh, being able to convince the uh, stakeholders that, okay, instead of uh, finding solutions for a whole nation, one solution for a whole nation, which is nearly impossible, let's look at the football strong centers that we have in, the, in Kerala, Goa, Bengal, in the northeastern states. And let's try to uh, uh, raise the uh, improve the infrastructure there because the the football mad aspect of the populace was already there. The uh, the the inclination towards pouring your hours into football is already there. So can we not just instead of finding a national league, can we not have a state level league? Can we not have a Kerala Premier League? Can we not have a Goa Premier League, a Calcutta uh, West Bengal Premier League? to uh, raise the standard of football in a very localized way and then when the standard you know, when the competition will improve the standard will organically improve and these country these states have more than enough uh, 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 people in themselves to be able to generate a competitive national sport in due time so 
how possible actually it is like in theory we can talk about this as much as we want but is there an appetite for something like this to actually exist in the long run it does exist so some of these competitions are actually older not some of them actually most of them are older than the national level competition so one has to understand and remember that uh, a certain zeg blatter in 1995 as fifa general secretary had come to india and had asked the uh, the then aff dispensation said why don't you have a national level league because they were showcasing you know we've got the durand cup which is the third oldest tournament in the world we've got the ifa shield we've got the rovers cup um all these other cups and then we've got the calcutta football league we've got the, you know the, the leagues in goa you know the goa pro league being the top of it uh, uh and all these kind of other competitions um and 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 the the pyramid is building itself at the moment to some extent because now you're saying isl i league i league 2 as it's going to be rebranded from hopefully this season or later next season and then you're saying you've got your local leagues i think that 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 step between national level and and local level there needs to be sort of regional level competitions that's that's the that's the missing bridge in that pyramid now the there is another problem that we have in in in, in these sort of uh, uh, leagues as well and for example in 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 bengal you have something which they call cape which is sort of local village football where players turn up get money play and then move on i was watching yesterday an interview on a channel bengali channel where they were talking to one of the players and he says listen i'm earning you know 1 and a half 2 lakhs a month playing these tournaments why would i bother about playing in the calcutta football league uh the same happens in go uh, sorry in kerala with with the sevens you know the sevens are played in bamboo stadiums where up to 30000 people turn up you know some of the african i remember in the past i think it even happened to you karim that some of your players suddenly pushed off for a week went to kerala played two three matches and earned more than they were earning uh, at the clubs that karim was coaching you know that that doesn't happen anymore at the top level at least but that there are these these the skate competitions or these these sevens or you know you've got the 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 taluka village competitions in goa so some extent have more fans attending than isl i league or even let's say the local league so that's that's a that's an interesting uh, issue and problem that one needs to sort of look at you know how does it to say that indian football doesn't have support is actually wrong from that perspective so therefore there are the local football has its own challenges the national level football has its own challenges and um this 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 thought process of either i am i'm a fan of local football i'm a, or i'm a fan of international football so either i'm messi or whoever that local player is and he's playing some competitions i hear that a lot from you know fans of east bengal and mohun bagan uh, or etk mohun bagan and east bengal fc to be correct in these days um that they don't have a connect to the to the teams anymore you know there is this this connection is, is is sort of is gone again we've had two seasons in the bubble where there was a total disconnect and 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 the generations are different we are india is I always when i go down i feel it's a country of of selfies you know it's 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 i've had the experience as i walk into salt lake stadium two people know me listen i'm not an important person but then suddenly 15 people want to take a selfie with me and i'm sure that these 15 people don't know who i am they just take a selfie for the sake of taking it so all these aspects of life uh, how life has changed over the last 10 15 20 years and uh, um i can i can say anshuman you're still young but kareem and i are a little older than you in that first aspect um that 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 life and football has also changed the younger generation i think uh, how how a kareem addresses his players today has to be different than it was 10 15 years ago because this generation they think they they approach life and the world totally different than than how we did or how how we do still do and that's all these things are a factor in in how to build football how to how to look at football and how to how to grow football i think that's the main thing to grow football the passion and and i always say unconditional support that is something is is very difficult fans do not want to support football in being unconditional they they think they can have a say and it doesn't matter if it's atk mohan bagan if it's manchester united or barcelona or bayern munich the fans want to be involved in what's happening but if they're honest they actually not and even if you say people's club and this and that everything no there are people in positions taking decisions that are making these decisions there are people in the federations who are making decisions often to the best of their knowledge or maybe the lack of it but they're trying to build this and all of these factors that which i've mentioned make it 
you know, make it make it so challenging to does it matter if it's Indian football or football anywhere else in the world? And if you get one or two aspects right, and therefore I like the Vietnam example quite a lot at the moment, is that they've done a lot of things and they're taking it to the next level. Uh, I don't know, but just to to con to conclude regarding this topic, it's the pyramid. You know, the pyramid, it, normally we should start from the base to have a good... But what I'm... Uh, just to sum up what I said, maybe uh, for for the current scenario and the way it is, maybe we should start from the top. And I think already uh, the fact that there is two football-minded people at the helm of the federation. Kalian Chobi, ex-football player, and uh, Shaji, who is involved in, in Delhi football for, for a long time. It's already good, and I'm sure that, that you see they, they already started by taking their, their... They are not sending some officials or something. They are going themselves to see what's going on. And I, I think... It's good to go to Spain, to Belgium, some of the best in the world, but it's also good to go and inspire from some countries who was 10 years ago in nowhere and now some of the best. And I would welcome them. I, I would even uh, get involved to help uh, that they come to Morocco as well. You know, Morocco was, hey, we are fourth of the, of the world. Uh, we dominate second half of France, the future world champion in the semifinal. Uh, if you watch the game, and and maybe uh, uh, we, we, four years ago, ten years ago, I don't think anyone, even at the start of the World Cup, anyone would have dreamed that we would have uh, this uh, performance. What is excellent, and we should anyone who who wanted to develop and to go from where they are to the top is the the, the fact that is heartening is many players. Uh, they come to those academies that I just talked to you, the private academy in Mohamed Sixth. The best, our, some, one of our best players who, who played, who you had seen how he played the, during the whole World Cup, and especially against Spain when Luis Enrique, he told them where, where the hell that number eight come from. And I was, I was uh, critical to Luis Enrique because it shows that Spain underestimate Morocco, so I didn't because if he did the, the video analysis and he did his homework, he will know that is a talent uh, that, that we have, which now make a, a big move to Olympic Marseille. So uh, him, uh, number eight, Unahi, uh, the striker and Siri, uh, the third goalkeeper, uh, uh, Tegnauti, uh, the Agert, who is in West Ham English Premier League now, and won man of the match in many games recently. These are four that did the same uh, things when there was, and they're young. Uh, these we're talking about 21, 22 uh, years players. So four years ago, six years ago, they started the process that was made from the top, not the base, of a good academy. One good academy gave you four players starting 11 in, uh, in, in a World Cup. So it is possible. And that's why I would say it's good to see what the best for years have are doing, but it's good to see where some countries that there was nowhere a few years back and what they did to become uh, Morocco is one of them. And I I would say to my friend uh, Kalyan and to my friend Shaji that we know each other very well, they are most welcome in Morocco, and I can help to make the arrangement and and uh, making them in connection with the, those people at the helm of our federation. And I certainly hope for them that they are listening so that we can make that happen. So I'll, I'll, pass, that, on the, I, I pass, on, pass on the message. Okay, I'll pass on the message. So you that, understand yeah. that or not, but what I'm uh, trying to say, uh, Belgium and Spain, yes, they are, but they have the foundation. You see the pyramid? Belgium and Spain have a strong foundation already. Uh, we, I tell you right now, in Morocco, the pyramid is like this. The foundation is kind of average. Though the top we are fought and we are building something, but the foundation is upper. So maybe it, it, this is what we should see also what Senegal did. Senegal is an African champion. They qualify consistently from the youth and, and all that. And they are doing some great things different than Morocco. What they are doing, like there is a, a 
you know, there were the Academy Muhammad Six that I showed you that gave those slow players. Just recently, a few days ago, they organized an international tournament. International tournament under 19, where there was Real Madrid, where there was Olympic of Marseille, many clubs top division in France, in Spain. And there was the Academy under 19. There was Swiss club, one of the most, when I told you three clubs are top, one of them. First, Fatih uh, Rabat, Fish of Rabat. And there was from Africa, Generation Football. Generation Football is one of the best academies now in Senegal. So what I said about the Academy Mohamed VI for us, the Gener Generation Foot is, and Generation Foot was made by funds from, from abroad. We found our fund, but from Europe, and they take the best players to Europe. I think uh, Sadio Mane is coming through that process. So I guess uh, who was the final generation foot from Africa? I guess the best club of uh, Rabat from Morocco. The semifinal, the Academy Mohamed VI played the semifinal. Whereas, look, look now, the, even the future is coming better. Where is the Real Madrid? Where is Olympic Marseille? Where PSV Eindhoven, uh, final, all was in the tournament. But the four out of four teams top in this tournament and the 19 was three African teams, two from Morocco and one from Senegal. So we should, in my opinion, we should find out what Senegal is doing, what Morocco is doing, what Africa is doing to, to, to come up. Right. Uh, so that brings us very nicely towards the end of this episode. Uh, Arnava, I will come to you first because I would like Karim to have the last word. So, yeah, so the, just uh, the, just sum, sum, sum this up for us as to uh, where do the Indian coaching system need to go in the short and long term from this point? I think we need to put a lot more focus on grassroots and youth football. I think that's very, very important. I think it's not only just, you know, what Karim said a while ago that it's not just about the licenses but it's about passion about understanding that you learn i think a lot of people are running after jobs which is also of course understandable because they need to live you know that's that's you know, we should not forget that but while, while football should not be a, a 9 to 5 job you know it should be 24/7 you know people <laughs> like all of us we were we 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 are crazy right we're spending all of our time on the sport in some sort of formal way and uh, that's a thing very very important I think what we need to do also is to to create avenues and pathways for our Indian coaches at the top level. You know, like once the ex players were sort of coming out, uh, that these boys get opportunities to go abroad and learn. I think that's very very important. I think we are too insular in that that we are within our system. I think these guys need to get opportunities uh, to go abroad, uh, uh, learn. You know, do internships uh, in 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 different football systems. It doesn't always have to be Europe. I think there's this. Too big fascination about Europe. I think there are because I think, as as Karim said, Europe is too developed, too too organized, too structured. The foundations are right. You know, how do you work around with problems and issues? Um, so therefore, that's interesting. Or for example, if you have great infrastructure, but some of the other your football isn't working. The Middle East, for example, very interesting one. How are the people in Southeast Asia um, doing their things? Japan. How's Japan built its football over the last thirty years? So all of these, you know, they. Get new experiences, get new insights, and and try and build yourself. And then I think only then we can improve and 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 have better coaches who can then also produce better players. And that's then the end product, which I think is very very important because then the club football will be better, and in the long run, then also the national team will be better. Right. Uh, so Karim, I have uh, two questions for you. The first question is the one I asked her now as to well, where do the Indian coaching has to go in the short and long term? And the second question, and the final question, is that uh, what's next for you? And uh, is there a possibility of you returning to India in football in the future? You know, uh, I'm uh, uh, for for the first question. I I I kind of agree with the, what said Aaron Alain. I think we said a lot of things regarding the the coaches. Uh, some responsibility lies on them, on the coaches themselves. They should not be satisfied and keep uh, developing themselves. The game change uh, every time with the, with the by the time going. Look at the look at the tactics. Look at even tiki taka of uh, 
of Guardiola a few years back was running the show with Spain and Barcelona. And uh, now, uh, recently, is rather the philosophy of Klopp of uh, uh, pressing and begging pressing. Uh, and now, even that, uh, with that, Liverpool, uh, uh, other coaches has found the way to beat Liverpool, despite having that, uh, that person. People say, uh, because Sadio Mane left, or I don't think so. I just think that coaches do work hard to find ways to beat the best and when you are the best, there will be always people trying to find ways to beat you. So coming back to that football is changing and the coaches, they need to be on continuous recy recycling mode to, to find new things, to, uh, to, to, to develop new things. Uh, the other responsibility regarding coaches lie on the officials of clubs, of uh, regional states. They should... Uh, have uh, they should have patience. They should have trust on uh, the best local coaches. Not every coach, but at least when uh, some coaches he just mentioned Reni De Singh, uh, uh, Meraj uh, Wadu. I just spoke to him uh, recently uh, that he took uh, Muhammadan now. So uh, I think that's the way forward. This kind of understanding from both sides to to keep going. Uh, the, and also, we are talking about the developments of football and all what we talked about, the strategical part of it, the choices, whether to start from bottom or to take care also of the top. All this, when football developed in the country, uh, it pulled everything. It pulled the coaches, it pulled the league, uh, and everything will follow. Uh, and regarding me, I, to be honest with you, I'm... I tried uh, many times to come back to ISL, uh, but, uh, you know, as Arunava said, this is new generation. I started by saying my, saying my achievements in Indian football. Uh, the, uh, there were some amazing times, but unfortunately now there is new, the new people at the, at the helm. Maybe they don't know what, to, what was happening. And I can assure you that Karim Ben Sharifa of 2023 is far, far, far better than Karim Ben Sharifa. Uh, the nine years that spent in India, because I did new experiences. One of the uh, two of the experiences that I'm very fond of is uh, two years at the at the uh, national team department in our federation, 2017 to 19. Uh, I was lucky uh, as an assistant coach of under 23 men to work with the players like Unahi, like Nsiri, like Mazraoui, who was part of that group. Uh, I was the assistant coach of the, the current coach of Syria, the Dutch coach called the, um, Mark Roth. And uh, I developed myself a lot beside him, but I was also working with the technical director, the uh, French-Moroccan, but I would honestly say that he was one of the main uh, architect of what's happening now because he's the one who started before even the build, uh, building the academy, the Academy Mohammed Six that I uh, send you, Arunava, uh, uh, Nasser Larget, uh, a Moroccan French, uh, who was in France. Uh, he's specialist of the formation of the youths, and he's the one. Even the construction, the there was only the land. He was involved with his expertise and experience in Europe to say where the field should be, where the restaurant should be, where the hotel should be. And he built that and worked for about six uh, years, I think, there. And uh, was part of the development of many players who are now stars. And immediately after that, became for six or seven years as the technical director of the Federation. And he's the one who gave me the chance to work, whether with the under-23 men, but also for two years with the women's senior team of Morocco. Uh, at that time, when I took over, I think we was 120 in the world. Uh, the team average age was about 31. Uh, part of my responsibilities was to create, to build a stronger uh, team. Uh, and after my departure, after two years of work, we did, I think, about 18 camps, played about uh, plenty of games. Camps We did camps also in... Africa, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, in in, uh, in South Africa. And uh, when I left, the team was, I think, uh, 79 in the world, uh, with an average age of 24. 
with many under 20 uh, uh, that, uh, that are part of the team. And that work was continuing. And now the, there are 70% of that squad that I have now in the senior team. And the senior team is champion of Africa. While when I took over 17 years, never qualified even. And uh, is qualified to the World Cup uh, in Australia and New Zealand. I'm talking about the women's senior team. You know that the under 17, because of what I explained to you, they participate in the World Cup in India, and the 17 Morocco uh, girls. So you see, it's a it's a global dynamic that is going on in futsal. We are one of the best. We are top eight teams in the world. We start competing with the best, which is Brazil. We beat them in Brazil for uh, we played the last month. I think two friendly games in Brazil against Brazil. We beat them the first game and we lost the second game. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, I I did, just to tell you that I developed myself more. My last experience, uh, last two, the uh, last one abroad was in Guinea as a head coach of one of the best teams in Africa, Hafia Conakry. And the next for me is uh, uh, going to, I would be involved with Singapore FA. Uh, in a, in a position that you will know about it soon. I think I'm I'm going next week, and uh, uh, yeah, it is a professional uh, choice, but also personal choice because my kids are are from there and they reach an age where they they have to also uh, be there with me. So, uh, but yeah, India would be always in the future the destination for me. Uh, in any capacity, I think now I reach uh, an age of 55 and I have plenty of experience behind me. I can be a head coach. I can be a good technical director. I can be even uh, a good director of a club where I can share all these experiences that I had. Let's not forget, uh, I'm coming back to Singapore, but I have coached in uh, almost uh, eight uh, countries. Nine, if I count, when I was the coach of the national team of Brunei, we played as a club in the M League, Malaysian League. So I, I was uh, uh, based in Brunei, but we played the, the Malaysian League. So the, if I if you count this as two countries, it's nine countries when I lived and uh, and worked. So I think if any people who are uh, football brain smart, they will want to. To, to use that uh, vast experience in developing something or a project. But for now, I commit myself for uh, two years uh, with the Singapore FA. Uh, right. Uh, Gary, Alnaba, thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. Listeners, that was uh, it for today. And uh, we will come back next week with another aspect of Indian football. Thank you for listening and goodbye.